The how-to welding class has moved on to stick, SMAW, electrode arc welding. I trust that the gas welding sessions were of value if you haven't seen them yet. I'd encourage you to go back and review them. Gas welding is a foundation for all of the other welding processes. I'd like to take a moment to describe the uses of stick welding. Stick welding has been popular in industry for pipeline welding, for a variety of processes, both indoors and in the field. It is a substantial method for fusing metals together and can be used in all kinds of environments. Short of a downpouring rain or exposure to moisture, shielded metal arc welding is the all-around multi-purpose welding process. As we move now into stick welding, I'd like to begin by covering the equipment that's necessary, actually vital, there are two types of SMAW stick electrode welding, alternating current or AC and DC direct current modes. I will demonstrate both and each has its niche and I'll discuss that as we move along in the process. When it comes to equipment, you have a variety of choices. Everything from a buzz box AC welder without DC provision to a full on AC DC welding outfit or even a portable generator and welder combination. If you're on a budget, I would encourage uh, looking for a buzz box, something like a, a Lincoln or a Miller, if you're fortunate enough, or Hobart, that has been treated properly and is still in serviceable condition. A 230 single phase welder should be available in the $100 to $250 range used. And if that is your budget, that's great. Stick welding is possible with a full range of equipment choices. For our shop, we elect to use the HTP America Invertig 221 machine, actually our liquid cooled TIG machine that can easily handle AC and DC arc welding as well. So we'll convert the machine from TIG use to the use of stick. And in this case, we will demonstrate AC and DC processes. What I like about this machine is its versatility. And if you're looking for new equipment, I would heartily encourage going to the HTP America USA Weld site and seeing the offerings. I'm sure that you'll agree as you see how the Invertig 221 machine performs that this is a quality option and professional grade equipment. As always, I will be performing the welding tasks that you see in the How To Welding class section on stick welding. I'm looking forward to demonstrating the equipment and processes. But before we do that, let's do an evaluation of the equipment that you really should have. The equipment needs to get started with stick welding are not excessive. If you do have limited funds, I will show the bare essentials that you need to do effective stick welding in a safe manner. To begin, you will need a welding machine. In our case, we're using the Invertig 221, which is actually a liquid-cooled TIG that can be used for AC and DC stick welding as well. This machine is exceptionally versatile and offers features that are very useful for a wide range of welding needs. We'll get into setting up this machine when we start our welding process. Without question, you do need a safe work area. Now, this doesn't have to be a large work area, as long as it's safe, and you've taken into consideration how to avoid flammable materials catching fire and setting your shop on fire. If you don't have a welding bench, you can build one. In fact, that would be a first project with your stick welder. This bench, which I constructed, has served very well. It has a heavy steel top, 3 eighths of an inch thick, that supports a lot of weight. And all of the seams are tight for the backsplashes to make sure that slag and other hot pieces are not falling off on the floor or finding their way into areas where flammables might exist. As you can see, this workbench completely protects the wall. It has a galvanized spark guard that I've created and the recent construction of a rack that supports the cardboard cartons of filler rod. Notice that I have a fire extinguisher handy and this should be up to date. Old fire extinguishers are really not a good idea. They can be unsafe. 
I also use a metal tool cabinet for all of my welding supplies to make sure that they're tucked inside away from sparks and flames and well underneath the table top. The supplies and tools used for stick welding are minimal. In fact, this is one of the most cost-effective methods of welding. You do need a wire brush and clamps, and clamps can run a range of costs. On the wire brush, if you're working with stainless steel, make sure that the brush is stainless. Otherwise, the typical welding brush is sufficient. You'll need a slag hammer. This is a chipping hammer. One end of it is like a chisel point, the other is sharp, and you do need this to knock slag off of your welds. These are electrodes. They should be kept dry, always out of harm's way and away from moisture. They'll last for years as long as they're kept dry. A grinder is always handy for prepping metal and making sure that you have smooth edges when you're done. And a quality bench vise can protect materials and keep them firmly clamped so they're not falling to the floor. As we proceed with the stick welding sessions, you'll learn more about equipment, in particular the equipment that we use from HTP America, and filler materials, including niche fillers supplied by Weld Mold Company, in this case cast iron rod, that meets specific needs when repairing or building up castings. Protective gear is essential when you're welding. There are a variety of glove types available and some are well suited for niche applications and not very well suited for others. These are wonderful gloves for TIG welding. They would make very poor gloves for use with electrode stick welding. For electrode stick welding you need a heavy duty glove. Gloves like this work fine and if you want something that's a little bit more upscale, these new gloves, my replacement for the worn ones that I just showed you, really make a good choice. They have no max lining and they're ideally suited for protecting you from hot metals that you're handling and from hot electrodes as well. Another must as far as protective gear goes, in my view, is a leather coat. This can be snapped around the collar very tightly to prevent any kind of hot slag or anything when you're doing overhead position in particular from falling down below the collar and causing severe burns. Remember, it's always difficult to get hot slag or metal pieces away from your body if they've gone down inside clothing. Never wear pants with cuffs. Always make sure that your gauntlet gloves like these cover your sleeves so that you don't get metal inside the glove. Hot metal inside this glove would be a real handful and would create skin burns before you could get the glove off. So regardless of the ambient temperature, I always wear leathers, especially when doing overhead position DC welding or any exposure to slag and hot metal that might fall down inside clothing or otherwise damage my skin. Always avoid burns. Make sure you wear protective gear. This leather is substantial and it works really well as a barrier to hot slag and molten metal pieces. A very important element of all forms of welding is a helmet or eye shielding. In the case of stick SMAW welding, I prefer an automatic helmet that in this case will dim to the shade that it's set for in one twenty-five thousandth of a second. Regardless of where you secure your helmet, make sure that it has ANSI approval, a specific ANSI rating. As you can see, I also use leather off the bottom of the helmet and this protects my neck, my thyroid area, my collar from exposure to ultraviolet. Another good reason to wear long-sleeved welding coats is to protect yourself from UV damage that results from exposure to welding processes. The only exception to this is gas welding where you wear a lighter shield. In all other welding processes, you need a substantial helmet, proper shielding, the degree of shielding required for the welding process, in this case it is adjustable, the actual shading is adjustable for the range of needs that I find with arc, TIG, and MIG welding. This helmet works well for me and was not that expensive. You often see welders wearing these protective caps. This is not completely flame proof, but it's certainly a barrier that would protect you from slag falling into your hairline 
or anything of that nature. You want to avoid heat contact with your skin. This underneath the helmet is not a bad idea. It's just added protection. Again, I keep gloves and other items in the drawers below the workbench. The workbench extends to the edge of the toolbox so I don't have hot slag falling off into the tool drawers and that's really important. What you don't need is to be under your welding hood and actually have a fire develop that you're not even aware of. So use every precaution you can. On the floor itself I have a piece of galvanized sheet metal that protects the cement. Cement can be damaged by hot welding slag falling onto it. And another protective barrier, of course, is a welding blanket. And today's welding blankets are non-asbestos. Again, this is not made of asbestos material. You can get Kevlar or fiberglass even. This is not completely flame-proof, as these holes attest to. So don't rely on this as a total barrier. If hot metal slag, molten slag, is actually falling to the floor, this is protection, but it is not completely burn proof. Before we set up the HTP221 machine, I'd like to show the electrode holder. This quality of professional holder will enable you to put, in this case, 8th inch 7018 rod, but whatever electrode you're using, into a variety of angles and that would include a 45 or a 90 or a 45 in retro. So be certain that whatever welding equipment you get, you have an exceptionally good electrode holder and also make sure your ground clamp is substantial. The HTP ground clamp is one of the best I've ever found. It has a very strong spring. It uses a ground strap between these two jaws. You can see that the connectors are copper of very good quality and the spring tension is substantial on the jaws so that we will get a really good bite when we're hooking this to our metal pieces for grounding. This wraps up our introduction to SMAW stick welding. In the next session we'll move on to setting up the equipment for our actual welding processes. We'll set up the HTP221 machine in AC and DC stick modes and we'll get started on welding right after that.